What is insulin resistance? A lot of people have heard of insulin resistance. They know that it's a big problem, but how big a problem is it? And where does it come from? Is insulin a bad thing? Well, today we're going to talk about all these things so that you understand it and hopefully so that you understand it well enough to help others start understanding it because this is maybe the biggest health problem that we have in the Western world. Stay tuned. Insulin resistance is exactly what it sounds like. It's the body's resistance to insulin. Insulin is a good thing. It's been around for as long as life has been around and it helps us survive. The purpose of insulin is to store the excess. Whenever we have feast versus famine, when there's a feast and we have some extra, then the insulin is there to store it. So insulin is an anabolic hormone. Anabolic means to build up. And what are we building up? We're building up tissues. We're building up reserves. We're building muscles. We're building fat. We're building up anything that can help us survive later. So when we have plenty, we want to save for a rainy day so that later when we don't have so much, we can start using those stores. We can break down the stores and that's called catabolic. But today we're going to talk about uh, the anabolic part because that's what insulin is. The purpose of everything that you eat is to turn that food into fuel and building blocks. And insulin has to do with both, but when we talk about insulin resistance, we're primarily concerned about the fuel part. So anytime that you eat something that raises blood sugar, that sugar is in the bloodstream and it can't get into the cell without the help of insulin. So insulin is like a key. It's a hormone that plugs into the lock and it opens up the door so that the glucose can get inside the cell. And this is a very tightly, very precisely regulated process. It doesn't happen by itself. And remember that insulin is an anabolic hormone. It stores the excess. So when we eat carbohydrates, then there is an enormous response of insulin because that purpose of that carbohydrate is part of it is fuel in the moment, but most of it gets converted into fat that we can put in storage and use for later. Protein also has a moderate insulin response because protein also gets turned into tissues. We use it to build tissues and muscles. But fat doesn't have any insulin response to speak of. It's virtually zero because fat doesn't get turned into storage or into tissue. It is already the form that the body needs it, which is fuel. So when we eat carbs, we want to turn it into fat for future use, but the fat itself is already fueled, so it doesn't have an insulin response to it. Everything that you eat is to become blood sugar one way or another. And the body likes it to be in a very, very narrow range. And if you eat after a meal, it should be somewhere between 80 to 120. If it's been a while since you ate, then it should be somewhere probably between 75 and 95, a fasting blood glucose. And that's a very, very narrow band. That means that at any given time, you have about one teaspoon of sugar in your bloodstream. So anything more than that is excess and it has to be stored and that's what the insulin does. And why does the body want the blood glucose so tightly regulated? Because excess is toxic to the brain. A diabetic without insulin, where the blood sugar goes through the roof, they can end up in a coma. Or if they take too much insulin so their blood sugar plummets, they can also end up in a coma. So on the one hand, it's toxic. On the other hand, it is too low to where the, the body, the brain doesn't have enough fuel to function. That's why the brain functions the best. It can do the things it needs to do at a very steady supply. It's like you throw a log on the fire and it gives a steady 
stream of, of warmth for, for many, many hours. Carbohydrates is more like you throw a can of gasoline on the fire and it all burns up in an instant. So if we want to capture that, all that energy, then we have to be able to convert it to something else and store it. So that's what's happening. So let's look at a normal situation with a cell. So this here is a cell and inside it I've written little triangles that are supposed to be glucose. That's not their normal shape, but it's just easier to draw that way. And we have a small number. Then some of that glucose gets con converted into fat, and some of the fat is circulating around on its own. But in both cases, we have just enough for that cell to function for a while. And then outside the cell, we have more glucose. That's the blood glucose. It hasn't entered the cell yet. And the red circles are insulin. And the insulin is there to assist the glucose to enter the cell. So as we use up some glucose inside the cell, then it needs to be replenished so that the cell has fuel for its continued function. And this would be a normal situation. It's tightly regulated. It's a flow and it's an ongoing process that gives the body what it needs and not too much, not too little. But when we start eating a lot of carbohydrates and we start eating many, many times a day and we start eating snacks in between, now we have more carbohydrate, we have more glucose. So that's all of these little triangles in the cell. The, the cell is jam-packed with glucose and when the cell can't use that glucose, it starts converting it into fat and it starts storing inside the cell first as fat and then it starts spilling over so that it gets into the blood and then it can get into other cells to be stored as fat. It, anything the body can't use at the time has to be stored. And then outside the cell, we still have tons and tons of glucose. There's an abundance, there's an excess of glucose outside the cell because we keep eating carbohydrates. We keep eating frequent meals so the body doesn't have a chance to burn through the stuff that you ate at the previous meal or yesterday. So the stuff just keeps building up. But remember, in the bloodstream, it's toxic. The brain can't handle that much glucose, so that's an emergency. And the body says, hey, we got to get this glucose out of the bloodstream. Let's make a bunch of insulin. So the more glucose we have, the more insulin is needed to push, to open up the door for that glucose to get into the cell. But the cell is already full. Where is it going to go? And this is where the cell becomes insulin resistant because there is an excess of glucose inside the cell, there's an excess of glucose outside the cell. Because of the excess glucose outside, there's also an abundance of insulin called hyperinsulinemia. There's too much insulin. And all that insulin is trying to push the glucose in, but there is no room. And the cell is saying, can't take anymore. I don't care how desperate you are to get rid of that glucose in the bloodstream we have all we can handle. That is how insulin resistance happens. And the problem now is because the insulin is a storage hormone, it's an anabolic hormone, it works primarily to put things inside the cell rather than allowing them out, then we have all of this fat inside this cell and inside a bunch of other fat cells and inside the liver but we can't get to it because there's too much insulin. Insulin is a storage hormone. It's a one-way hormone. It puts things in. It doesn't allow things to get back out. So if we look at the top reasons of why this mechanism happens, then it has to do with one, blood glucose. When we eat a lot of carbohydrates, then we're driving up glucose on a regular basis. But that is typically not enough because there are lots of cultures around the world that have subsisted on a high carb diet. They've eaten potatoes, they've eaten corn, they've eaten rice uh, at very, very high levels, but they still don't uh, 
develop insulin resistance or at least not significantly or at least not in, in young ages. So the second thing that's required is frequency. And if you just eat a couple of times a day, you could probably live a long life and eat high carb and not develop insulin resistance. The third factor though is the key. And this is where our, our societies have changed so much and so quickly. And the third reason is sugar. Because sugar is a special thing. Sugar it exists in nature in very, very limited quantities. It's present in vegetables, it's present in milk, it's present in fruits, but in small quantities. But when we refine it, when we start adding it, when we extract it, the white crystal stuff, and put it in a bag and we add it to ketchup and to dressings and to cookies and ice cream, now we're getting many, many, many times more than we ever could from nature. And what's the problem with that? The problem with sugar is that it is 50% glucose and 50% fructose. And the fructose is a special kind of sugar. The glucose can go straight into the bloodstream and it can be dispersed and every cell in the body can use the glucose. So if you weigh in 200 pounds, then you have 200 pounds of cells that can use glucose. So that glucose gets evenly dispersed and it gets burned off by those cells. But the fructose can only be metabolized by the liver. So now the sugar is 50% glucose and 50% fructose. So if you ate 100 grams of sugar, you got 50 grams of glucose that go evenly, but you also have 50 grams of fructose that can only be metabolized and transformed by the liver. And the liver, even though it's a sizable organ, it's somewhere around three pounds. So the liver now is getting 70 times more sugar than the rest of the body on average. And that is the overload that breaks the camel's back. And the liver is your primary metabolic organ. It's supposed to do hundreds of different things. It converts one thing to another, it detoxifies you, it handles your proteins, it changes blood, blood sugar, it uh, detoxifies alcohol, it makes glycogen, and does all these different things. And now we just threw a 70 times bigger load of sugar onto the liver. So this, the, the packed cell, this is what happens to the liver. And so sugar accelerates insulin resistance many, many, many times. It is even, you could go so far as to say it's difficult to get insulin resistance without sugar. But once you have insulin resistance, now you kind of broke the machine. You have a certain carbohydrate tolerance built into the machine, but the sugar broke it. And once it's broken now, you have to backtrack. You have to go much, much further. You have to be much, much stricter to reverse it than you would have to be to maintain it. And then in the light 1900s, I don't know the exact date, 70s, 80s, somewhere, they figured that, you know, sugar is conceivably the worst food ever devised by mankind, but let's see if we can make it a little bit worse. Let's see if we can really ramp it up and create some poison on steroids, if you will. And that's when they figured out how to make high fructose corn syrup, because now they developed a cheap sweetener that has a higher rate of fructose. So fructose is the stuff that poisons the liver because it can't go anywhere else. And high fructose corn syrup is anything that has higher than 50% fructose. So they just increased the horrendous portion of sugar even a little bit more. And now we're seeing, and then you combine that with the low fat diet and you scare people from fat and all of a sudden we have an epidemic of epic proportion of insulin resistance and diabetes and obesity and so forth.
So there are many ways of figuring out if you're insulin resistant and we're going to talk more in later videos but one of the basic things is to measure your A1C. Your A1C, your hemoglobin A1C is a three month average. It's a way of measuring what your blood sugar is on average over a period of three to four months. And if it is below 5.3, then in my opinion, it's good. It's okay. You are insulin sensitive. And in the medical world, if it is between 5.7 and 6.4, then you are pre-diabetic then you are insulin resistance equals prediabetes. And if it's over 6.5, then you have diabetes. And according to current numbers, I don't have the exact ones, but approximately 20% of the population is diabetic. And according to uh, official numbers, somewhere around 30% are insulin resistance or pre-diabetic. What does that mean? It means if you don't change something, if you just keep doing what you're doing, then if you're pre-diabetic, you are more than likely to become diabetic at some point in time. And the official guidelines suggest that you're okay all the way up to 5.7, but it kind of, it's obvious that it doesn't start at 5.7. You don't just all of a sudden end up there. It's a slippery slope. So I would say that you want to start paying attention as soon as you get over 5.3. Now you know that you're developing, you're starting the early signs. So instead of waiting for the full-blown diabetes or the severe insulin resistance, why don't we start working at it when you have mild or slight insulin resistance. And just to give you an idea of how widespread this problem is, then you could just look around and imagine the number of overweight people, which is somewhere around three quarters of the population in the United States, and that matches very, very closely to these numbers. 20% uh, diabetic, 30% insulin resistant, and in my opinion, 30%, and I'm guessing at the number of people that have that, but just based on overweight people and lifestyles, I would say somewhere around 80% of the population have mild to severe insulin resistance or diabetes. And again, if you don't change something, then that prediabetes, that insulin resistance will continue to get worse. And why should you be concerned? Because prediabetes and diabetes are associated with weight gain, increased blood pressure, increased risk of stroke, and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So all of the stuff that kills the most people is associated with insulin resistance and prediabetes. When is the best time to stop it? When it's full-blown or in the early stages? The answer is pretty obvious. So let me ask you something. Based on what we've talked about, based on your current understanding of, based on what we talked about, does this have anything to do with food? And if you paid any attention, I think you would say that yes, it has everything to do with food. And why am I asking that? Because when I went to do, get my own blood test done, there was a little flyer on the wall from the CDC, Government Agency Centers for Disease Control, and they had a screening test where they wanted to check and have a little questionnaire to see if you were insulin resistant. And here's what they were asking. Have you had a baby that weighed over nine pounds at birth? Then give yourself a point. Do you have a sibling with type two diabetes? Give yourself a point. Do you have a parent with type two diabetes? Give yourself a point. Are you overweight? Give yourself five points. Are you under 65 years of age, but you do little to no exercise? Then give yourself five points. Are you between 45 to 64 years old? Give yourself five points. Are you over 65? Give yourself nine points. And then they're saying, if you are three to eight points, then you should watch your lifestyle. You should eat low fat food. You should eat high grain food. You should try to be active. 
don't smoke and lose weight. Well, isn't that great advice? Eat low fat because that has no insulin response. Eat high grain because that has the most insulin response. Be active is a good idea because activity helps the body burn through the glucose that's in the muscles and the muscles can get the glucose from the bloodstream with less insulin when you're active. So that is a good idea. And of course, don't smoke. That's not a new thing. That's good advice. And then they say lose weight. And you're screaming after understanding this. I would love to, but I can't because I'm insulin resistant. All right. They're getting everything backwards. The insulin resistance, insulin is a storage hormone. It's the insulin that stored the weight and it's the insulin that keeps you from burning it. So that's useless advice because it's sort of just stating the obvious. You would if you could. And if you're nine points or more, which the only thing you have to do is to be over 65 to get nine points, then you should see your doctor because you're probably insulin resistant. And they're right. They're, the statistics point to that fact. But what they're missing is there's not a single question here about food. How many sodas do you drink? How much sugar do you eat? Do you eat processed foods? None of that. All of this means is if you had a baby over nine pounds, you produced a lot of insulin because you ate a lot of carbs. If you have a sibling, with type 2 diabetes, they ate a lot of carbs, so probably you eat a lot of carbs. If you had a parent with type 2 diabetes, they ate a lot of carbs, so you probably ate a lot of carbs. If you are overweight, then you probably ate a lot of carbs. If you are let under 65 and you don't exercise, then you probably ate a lot of carbs, but you didn't exercise to give your body a chance to burn it off. And then by the time you developed insulin resistance, now the exercise is still beneficial, but it can't really fix the, the problem. If you're 45 to 64, then that's how long you've been alive eating carbs. And if you're over 65 years old, then you've had more than 65 years to eat carbs. This is what they're saying, but there is no question about food in here. And then they tell you to eat low fat, high grain, etc. So based on that, based on that complete ignorance, it is no mystery why we have 80% overweight people and 80% insulin resistance and why the top killers are things like cardiovascular disease, stroke and diabetes. We have to start understanding that it's a storage problem. The cells have too much fuel and in the presence of insulin they can't use it and what's the medical solution is to give people things to push even more to help the body push more sugar into the cell to be converted to fat that's the solution and when the body can't keep up anymore and when the metformin and the glucophages aren't enough then we inject them with insulin to try to push even more inside. And it's the exact opposite of the solution. So that's how insulin resistance works. We're going to do some more videos on it so that we can expand and, and provide more detail and specific situations. If you enjoy this kind of content and you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so we can keep this content coming your way. And as you can tell by now, this is a big problem. Please share this information with anyone that you care about because it could save their life. Thanks for watching.